I Hate Politics is a podcast about a human activity we love to hate. I'm Sunil Dasgupta. This hasn't been much of a winter, but for decades now, the arrival of snow and ice have been met with millions of tons of road salt across the Northeast, Midwest, and in the Mid-Atlantic, including the Washington, D.C. region. Use of road salt not only corrodes infrastructure and automobiles, but all of it, unless it is picked up, goes into the waterways, raising salinity levels, even in drinking water and destroying plants and animals. Road salt is so cheap that it is easiest for municipal and state governments, as well as owners of publicly used private properties, such as a strip mall with a grocery store, to put down tons of it. Stores signal to customers that they are open with salt. I talked to Abby Heilman, director of the Isaac Walton League's Salt Watch program, a citizen science effort, and Carl Van Nest, a Montgomery County salt advocate, who say this, if you feel the crunch underfoot, you are using too much salt. Salt lowers the freezing point of water and so has a melting function. Salt should not be used for traction. I never lived a single day in a world without mass school shootings. With Columbine in 99, you'd think by now I'd be desensitized. Sandy Hook when I was in seventh grade. How naive was I to believe things would change? They never change. Cause that's the America we live in. That's the America we I Hate Politics is a podcast about our neighborhoods, workplaces, schools and streets, and our local governments as they function in diverse and democratic societies. This means our politics are messy, dirty, sometimes corrupt, with often self-serving politicians. But no matter how much we hate politics, we are never exempt from it, even when we refuse to participate. In fact, the purpose of politics is to keep society moving precisely when we don't agree with each other, like now. Music for this episode comes from Rockville singer-songwriter Gabriel Zvi. Gabriel graduated from MCPS in 2018 and now serves as a commissioner on Rockville City Human Rights Commission and the Montgomery County Committee Against Hate Violence. That's the America we fight for even though They fight back at us as they chant for life Bringing their guns to a playground fight And my friends, they never hear the end of it And I fear we'll never put an end to this How many of children will be lost to it how many times how many times you're listening to i hate politics i am sunil dasgupta it is battle stations in montgomery county these last few weeks over fentanyl overdoses students at kennedy northwood blair wheaton seneca valley Quince Orchard, Walter Johnson, Springbrook, and Einstein High Schools. That is, nine out of 25 county public high schools are reported to have had a fentanyl incident in January 2023 alone. MCPS and Montgomery County Law Enforcement organized an emergency press conference about this and is holding a fentanyl-related forum this coming Saturday 
January 28th. I should point out that this is unofficial data gathering. There may very well be other schools on the list. And there may be a school I mentioned that was marginally involved. MCPS did release comparative data from 2021 and 2022. There were 48 reported overdoses in 2022 of young people under 21, which is up from 27 overdoses in 2021. Of the 48, 11 died. 37 survived. The year before, in 2021, there had been five deaths. The number of youth deaths from fentanyl doubled between 2021 and 2022. County law enforcement has not offered any hypotheses, except to say that this is a regional and a national problem. We know that fentanyl is usually ingested when it is used to adulterate or cut with regular pain-killing opioids such as Percocet. We also know that patients usually resort to fentanyl or fentanyl mixed painkillers when they run out of or are denied their regular prescriptions. Sometimes they don't have the money to buy the prescription drugs, so they buy them on the street. With young people, the painkiller addiction route is highly problematic. Why are they being prescribed pain meds or addictive pain meds? Where is the supervision of the medications? What health conditions are driving these pain meds? Recently, there was a Maryland Department of Health report on overprescribing of psychotropic drugs in the state's foster care system, which it seemed did not have adequate monitoring systems in place. This is the definition of a public health problem. Teenagers are also believed to have access to pain medications in their homes where they are legitimately prescribed to other family members. They can buy on the streets as well. So actually being prescribed an opioid and then moving over to fentanyl is probably only a subset of cases. It is not clear which routes to fentanyl are more common in these cases and what explains the rise in fentanyl supply or demand at this time in Montgomery County. At the county press conference, Montgomery County State's Attorney John McCarthy highlighted Good Samaritan laws that protect those who call in overdoses. He pledged not to prosecute cases even if there was drug-related materials at the site. The Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee has been in the throes of a heated debate the last few months. At issue is the primary statutory purpose of the County Central Committee to appoint replacements for legislative seats vacated by resignations and deaths. Maryland does not have special elections. The new Moore Miller administration has been a giant vacuum picking up senior leaders for executive positions. This has opened several legislative seats recently and with it has come the debate over the legitimacy of the appointment process. At root is the question whether sitting members of the Central Committee should be allowed to apply for vacancies. Those who criticize this system see in the current process insider politics, lack of democratic input, and lack of transparency. If not special elections, they want to prohibit Central Committee members from applying for vacant seats themselves on which they and their colleagues would vote. But membership of the Central Committee has long been 
the traditional pathway to a legislative seat. And many current members see themselves as having worked hard and within the system to put themselves in a place from which they can go on to become state legislators. The even broader argument for the system as it exists is that the closed process has led to more women and minority candidates becoming legislators than might have been possible in open elections which are majoritarian. There are two visions at play here. One, where representation requires an open democratic process, and a second, which sees the closed process as producing better minority representation. I'll be back with community SALT activist Carl Van Nest and Isaac Walton League's Abby Heilman. We are people helping people not just the leaders of tomorrow we are the leaders of today advocating for the changes in this world well aware of what is right a message in the words we say sometimes we stop and think why are we doing what we do Abby Hallman, Carl Van Nest, welcome to I Hate Politics. Happy to be here. Thank you, Sunil. It's great to be here today. Abby, what is the nature of the road salt problem? A lot of people aren't aware that there even is a salt problem across the country. Um, unfortunately, every year we're putting down road salt on our roadways and sidewalks to stay safe during the wintertime. Um, but a lot of that salt ends up in our waterways and can even end up in our drinking water as a result as well, um, causing many different issues across the, the country. Um, from corrosion issues with our infrastructure um, to issues with wildlife. Carl, what are you seeing in Montgomery County and Maryland more generally? What, what I see is elevated um, chloride levels along different streams. Um, as, you know, um, a member of the Muddy Branch Alliance, we see, you know, elevated levels in um, the Watts Branch, um, the Muddy Branch Stream, Seneca Creek, um, you know, Cabin John, um, you know, Creek, and those kinds of um, those kinds of watersheds. How elevated is salt in those waterways? One would expect the chloride level to be about 35 parts per million. That's kind of a natural level. Um, we see after a snowstorm, we'll see elevated levels um, well over 250 parts per million. Um, for three months, and we'll see in in our stream right now, um, we'll go a year with the chloride level at different locations being over 100 parts per million. Abby, can you talk to the question of toxicity, chloride toxicity? What are the Clean Water Act levels? Uh, what are you know? At what levels do they start harming? Um, you know, species or vegetation or even people? Yeah, great question. So the EPA, they have a set um, secondary standard for drinking water, and that standard is 250 parts per million. Um, after that point, or sort of at that point, depending on the individual, you can start tasting the salt in the water. It might not be identified as salt, um, but you can start tasting something within the water. 
There are additional standards as well. Um, in 1988, there was an ambient water quality criteria for chloride. Um, and this is specifically more so targeted towards wildlife. Um, and they've noticed as far as like the low end number, 230 parts per million um, over a couple day period um, is something that harms different aquatic life, such as um, macro invertebrates. Carl has found 250 parts per million. The Clean Water Act allows 250 parts per million. You are saying that it harms certain kinds of species at 230, which is not that far from 250, to be honest. So if and given those circumstances, either we have to say that the clean water standards are wrong or that you know, we may be barking up a wrong tree. Well, let me interrupt just for a second. I mean, I, I, well over 250 parts per million. Sometimes right after a snowstorm, it's, you know, 600 parts per million. And we'll have weeks where it's 600 parts per million. Over, the, over a period of three months, it will be, it can easily be well over 250 parts per million for that period of three months after, you know, two or three snowstorms. So I imagine the road salt problem is worse in the winter states. So, you know, the Midwest or uh, New England, you know, even. Um, can you say uh, which states do worse, understanding fully that some states are going to use more salt because they are, uh, they have longer winters? Yeah, so it's not necessarily the states themselves. Um, but it has to do more so with um, how much impervious surface area or like sidewalks and pavement there is within a region. So areas, especially cities, for instance, they tend to have higher levels of chloride um, or salt whenever we're testing waterways near them. Um, but also sort of as you move up um, north, the problem seems to get a little bit worse. And a lot of those places have sort of worse winter weather as well. Um, our climate here in Maryland is a little bit confusing because there's so much freeze and thaw that's happening. And so for us, since that happens a lot, we tend to use quite a bit of salt in our region as well. Um, but I do want to mention that a lot of the departments of transportation around the country, they're doing a really good job of trying to reduce the amount of road salt that they're putting down. Anytime you're going out and you see sort of sprayed lines um, along streets, um, they're actually using a brine solution. So that's a salt water mixture. So they're actually reducing their amount of salt that they're using when they're pre-treating the roadways. And pre-treating also helps to make sure that things aren't sticking to the roadways too. Um, so they're trying to reduce their road salt um, in many different ways. And that also makes it so the taxpayer has less money going into road salt pollution. too. We understand that in order to mitigate the effects of climate change, we have to densify where we live. So we have to increase densities where we live and so that we can leave other areas alone. How do you balance the need for housing density and this generation of chloride in water? There's no really good solution to like for road salt right now, we can't completely do away with it because we need to stay safe during the winter. Um, but we need to be more mindful about how we use road salt. Um, for instance, learning a little bit more about it. Road salt does not create traction. Um, that's a common misconception. Um, and then you also shouldn't really feel a crunch underfoot as you're walking with road salt. Um, one thing that we're really trying to push this year with our campaign is to shovel early and often because then you're going to be putting down less road salt. Um, and then when you are ready to put down road salt after you've shoveled quite a bit, a 12 ounce coffee mug, so your typical drinking mug, if you fill that up with salt, that is actually enough salt to use for 10 sidewalk squares or 20 feet of um, driveway space. And then um, also sweeping up that salt after you've applied it. 
So um, if the weather has sort of changed, everything's melted, you can actually sweep up that road salt and you can use it again um, for the next storm event. So little things that we can do for that, again, being more mindful about our salt use is something that is a little change that can go a really long way. And then something that Carl um, and the Muddy Branch Alliance are really amazing at is reporting some of those salt spills that they're seeing too. Carl, what is your understanding of where the crux of the problem lies, you know, in Montgomery County? Is it the homeowners? Is it these big spills? The, the biggest issue is, you know, smart distribution of salt um, by the state, the county, and the city first. They are the largest distributors of salt. Second is um, private organizations like um, shopping centers, you know, apartment complexes um, and organizations like that. They are afraid, um, a lot of those organizations are afraid of slip and fall liability issues. And um, uh, in regard to stores, they want to look like they're open for business. So, you know, stores are just big distributors of, you know, of salt out in front of their, their places. So, you know, training, um, salt applicator training is an important aspect of the whole thing, too. Um, Abby, how do you advocate with these big distributors of salt? At the Isaac Walton League, this last year in August, we actually hosted an applicator training program and learning a lot more about how to apply salt, when to apply salt, how much salt to apply. That's something that we're planning on doing again in Gaithersburg this coming year. And then at the same time, the Maryland Department of the Environment, they are putting together their own applicator training program um, for the state. How many people took the course last year? Yeah, so we had, um, I think, about 18 people take the course. Do you think you can achieve these goals without legislation? Um, I think that legislation certainly helps with certain some of these things. Um, Carl is a really big advocate um, for pushing some of this stuff um, legislation-wise as well. It's really tricky because as a national organization, there's different things happening for every single state. So it's not as easy as like, hey, let's push this for everything because every state has their own um, their own their own sort of background for and standards. Um, like Virginia, for instance, they do have a TMDL standard for chloride, um, total maximum daily load. Uh, Maryland doesn't have that. So everything's a little bit different. What happened to the legislation last year? It got stalled in committee. Which didn't committee? Make it out of committee, which is a shame because, you know, again, heavily run Democratic committee, um, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to understand how these things can't get out of committee. Which committee? In, in, um, there's an environmental and traffic committee. Um, Kumar Barve runs it. Uh, Kumar Barve was very busy um, last, last term with other efforts. What about at the county level? I have sent numerous letters um, to our, our county executive and um, county council members. I have heard you say that the city of Gaithersburg does a good job. They do. Can you explain what is that good job? Well, first of all, I mean, I think they, they monitor the weather conditions really well. And so they don't, they don't put down salt to begin with if, if it doesn't need to get put down. Um, you know, we had a winter event um, uh, right around um, the hall in the middle of the holidays around Christmas and Gaithersburg didn't put down anything, which was great. But if you drove down Route 28, the state road, well, it was salted, okay? And it's a shame, but um, it's harder for the state because they're dealing with so many microclimates. I'm pretty sure the county, you know, salted also because I saw county um, salt trucks out. So Gaithersburg also puts down a good amount of brine. When, when there is something that's going to go down, they put down brine. And then they come through and they plow quickly thereafter. Something that's really confusing about road salt application, too, is that there's so many different jurisdictions. Um, I saw like a map of the Kentlands in Gaithersburg the other day, 
And it is so confusing. Um, like if I see this bill, who do I call? Because um, you could have even like this little square block and one of those roads could be a state road. One could be um, a Gaithersburg road. Another one could be like a private applicator area. And then if those intersections meet, then who's in charge of like a spill on that intersection too? Uh, Montgomery County, they have a specific website that you can look and see who is the applicator, um, whether it is the state or the county um, or a city or private who applicates like on your roads. You can even put in your address right there. Um, but that's a really big issue is even if one like governmental entity like Montgomery County say that they're doing a really good job, um, a state road could come by or there could be a state road and it could be really confusing. Like, oh, well, who's actually applying this salt here? Um, especially if they have hundreds of lane miles to cover too. This is not just road salt. It is pedestrian safety and bicycle safety, right? The same issues apply because the county points to the state. We can't do anything. The state is is busy doing 500 different things you know and can't focus on the immediate um problem at hand as a governance problem you it's a very important one i have seen salt and i've called actually repeatedly um uh 311 uh and to be only told that you know uh it's not uh, the Department of Transportation that's doing it. It's the um, General Services um, Department that's doing this. So, for example, public library lots are so heavily salted. Uh, I contacted DOT. They said, oh, my, this is not us. This is the General Services, even within the county, right? It's not even the state now. There was one time when I was driving behind an applicator on Moncaster Mill. And this thing was just pouring salt out of the back. And I was wondering, what is going on here? But there was no way I could find who, who to call or who is the responsible party. Well, you know, you, you bring up a good point. I mean, you know, part of the problem is, is salt is, you know, you know, some number like 60 or $70 a ton. It's so cheap that we throw it everywhere. Until we get to the point where People need to act responsibly with salt, and, and that means cleaning up after themselves. You know, it, it's going to, there, there are other alternatives too, not salting every place. You know, you can put up cones to block off a parking lot in the wintertime, you know, until, you know, two days later when it's 40 degrees and it all melts. Um, you know, those are alternatives that exist, but we don't take those actions when salt is, you know, $70 a ton. Well, what about a salt road salt tax to increase the price so that um, you know people are more careful with it? Absolutely. Are you advocating for it? I would advocate for that, but it's not a politically sound um, you know one because you know there's already a lot of pressure in Montgomery County. You know we're already too expensive to to you know you know adding us. Uh, legislators are hesitant to take that kind of step. Abby, have other states been more receptive to this kind of uh, thinking? As far as applicator training programs, New Hampshire sets a really good example. Um, they, for their applicator training program, once somebody is certified, um, they can receive free limited liability insurance. And then anyone who hires them can also receive free limited liability insurance. So that's an additional incentive um, that they have. I'm hoping that MDE sort of takes that on as part of their applicator training program. But it looks like that probably won't happen, at least for a couple of years. Wisconsin has Wisconsin SaltWise, which is a really awesome program. Um, and then there's some additional programs throughout the U.S. Apart from Wisconsin and New Hampshire that you talked about, are you seeing progress in some other states with this? Some states are also, um, I think, I believe it's Washington state. I, they're using acetates. I believe mostly on their roadways, which is supposed to be more environmentally friendly, but that upfront cost 
is considerably higher than sodium chloride. So to put it in perspective, a ton of sodium chloride, your typical road salt is about $70 per ton. Um, a cost of, um, I believe it's magnesium acetate is like 300 some dollars per ton. Carl, you have talked to me in the past about, you know, measuring how much salt we use. And one of the big problems with the situation right now is that we don't even know how much salt we are using. What is your proposal with regard to that? Well, you know, we, we, we've got to, we've got to have um, all jurisdictions need to track the amount of salt that they're putting down. You need to be able to ask them. They need to come back and say, we put down this much salt and we did it. We put down, you know, these many pounds per single lane mile. And so um, a lot of um, a lot of the trucks, a lot of the bigger, um, more um, specialized trucks, they 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 can they can dial up how much salt they put down on the street as they're driving. And so we need to know the number of tons that they're putting down and then the pounds per single lane mile. That way we can track, you know, Gaithersburg versus Rockville versus Montgomery County that have relatively the same, you know, same climates. For example, you know, Gaithersburg might put down, you know, 250 pounds per single lane mile and Rockville might put down 300 pounds per single lane mile. And we can say, listen, what are you doing differently? And, and the difference could be that Gaithersburg is putting down more brine. We need to get to that point. Management 101 is tracking the, the issue, and we're not doing it. Do you have a sense of how much brine costs relative to salt? So um, for the brine, I believe it's a like 30% of the brine itself is salt. Um, the setup is going to be more expensive. They'd have to either create their own setup and create their own brine, um, or they would have to purchase that brine from somewhere. Um, and that's going to be obviously more heavy to transport and everything since it does have water in it. Um, but again, you're using like 30% of that is salt and then 70% is water. Even pre-wetting the salt is helpful too. Education is a really big part of the issue and sort of how to solve it. Clean Water Act sets a 250 parts per million national standard. I mean, so we can set national standards. It's not like it can be done. I'm, I understand that different locations would have different needs and things. I mean, you can't have the same salt um, regulations in Florida, as you do in Minnesota, we designate um, plants by zones. So we could totally designate salt used by the same zones. You know, you're, you're, you're exactly right. But uh, it's, you know, um, but you, you can't think that we would just, you know, there, there's a, there's this, this, you know, quarter mile area next to the watershed, and we're going to put down less salt in the area near that, that that's that that stream you know overpass it, it's it's really a lot bigger than that it's it's you know everything goes down into these watersheds as far as like at a governmental level it's hard to track too um, or hard to test for the aquatic life standard um, across the country and this is a little confusing, does not exceed 230 milligrams per liter more than once every three years on average. Um, and if the one hour average concentration does not exceed 860 milligrams per liter more than once every three years on the average. So even if we have this really great monitoring program in place, like the Salt Watch program, our volunteers, maybe at the most, like Carl, are going out once a week. Um, they would need to be there like every single second of the day monitoring and then get an average for every single day. Um, so things like probes that are in the place um, that maybe the government or USGS has um, would be really helpful for that. But some of those probes even, they only do like four hours on average, and then could give you the average for the full day. Um, so even some of those monitoring 
um, methods aren't even good enough to be like, hey, we've exceeded this standard. Um, and then again, you have to have for the 230 milligrams per liter, three years on average too, um, to be like, hey, we've exceeded this standard. Um, yeah, we've got, we've got a lot of good data um, showing that the, these, these, these levels are elevated and everybody knows that the streams have elevated levels of fluoride in them. I mean, there's, that's, it's just a fact. Everybody knows it. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter. Yeah. We have elevated levels of carbon in the atmosphere and it doesn't seem to matter. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, that's just, just a fact. And, and maybe, you know, maybe it is the hammer that we need. You know, and speaking of hammers, you know, we do have an anti-salt petition that we're spreading. We've got about 340 signatures on our anti-salt petition, and it asks that we track salt um, on, you know, pounds per single lane mile, and that we have um, private applicators um, that they get trained. Um, it also asks that we clean up after ourselves when we put down salt. The idea that everything flows into the waterway is not just true of salt, but true of plastic. The waterways that we have, the ones that I walk by, ones in my neighborhood, are sometimes choked with plastic. When monitoring for salt, is there any effort to track that part as well? Or is it that you know, the salt is more important. Forget the plastic right now. There's so many things that are going into our waterways. Um, and so I know a lot of our volunteers, if they're in a waterway, they might see some of those plastic or maybe tires or whatever else is happening. And they do clean those up. Um, some might not. It's not something that we've been pushing specifically, but it's not something that we're like, oh, no, leave the plastic there. Carl Van Nest and Abby Heilman. Thank you for coming on I Hate Politics. Good luck reducing our road salt. Thank you very much for having us today. Thank you. Look at them, the way you look at them, like they are red or green or blue or rainbow all over. The way you look at them, like they are from another galaxy talk to them oh you won't talk to them they are not your kind and you can't even communicate you stay away from them cause they are from another galaxy You are listening to I Hate Politics. I am Sunil Dasgupta. What lessons can we draw from my conversation with Abby Heilman of the Isaac Walton League's Salt Watch program and with local activist Carl Van Nest? First, road salt is a well-known and persistent problem. But just like we put lots of carbon into the atmosphere and not care, we put a lot of salt into our waterways and not care. We also put other things in our waterways and not care. Plastics, fertilizers, even effluents. The Clean Water Act is now 50 years old and may need some change. But enforcing the Clean Water Act on behalf of salt and other pollutants is another matter. Second, it is worth noting 
that the biggest salt polluters are not private individual homeowners trying to get ahead of shoveling, but rather municipal, county, and state governments. It is truly interesting that governments generally hold themselves to different pollution standards than they do private bodies. Because salt is so cheap, it is used liberally. Shopping centers and office park owners put down visible amounts of salt to signal that they are open. Third, there are ways to help. Brine cuts down salt use by 70%, but requires some investment up front in brining tanks and appropriate applicator machines. But most importantly, there needs to be some re-education around salt for agencies and contractors who actually do this job. The education of the public in this regard and change in our use of road salt is really a lever to get the big salt users to track and reduce their salt use. Lastly, like everything else, there are universal governance issues embedded in the salt problem. The patchwork of jurisdiction that governs us locally makes it difficult to identify who is in fact responsible for which street or parking lot. Not dissimilar from the pedestrian and bike safety issues that I talk about all the time. If you can figure out salt... Maybe the rest will follow. That's all for this episode. You've been listening to I Hate Politics. I'm Sunil Dasgupta. Music for this episode comes from Rockville singer-songwriter Gabriel Zui. They graduated from MCPS in 2018 and now serve as a commissioner on Rockville City Human Rights Commission and on the Montgomery County Committee Against Hate Violence. If you want to share your music on the show or know someone else who might want to, please sign up for updates at our website, ihppod.org, or email us at ihppod at gmail.com. I hope you'll subscribe and share the show as we bring you stories about politics close to you and to your home. See you next time. Why can't I just be me? Who you are, what defines you? Do we ever come without a label? These days when we were younger, these things didn't matter for me way. They showed me the corners of the world, said you can go this far in life, you can touch the Okay.